It's easy to get lost. This is The Revenue Maze, and I'm Valerie Cobb. Join me as we navigate the halls, dead ends, and U-turns on your path towards upward growth trajectory. The Revenue Maze is sponsored by Revenue North Star, guidance and execution through fractional revenue leadership, uncovering hidden revenues, and empowering small business growth through process-driven sales customized to your company environment. Welcome everybody to another episode of The Revenue Maze. I'm so glad that you are listening in and we have a fantastic guest today. I am super excited about her. She is highly, highly skilled at management. <laughs> She is also a co-founder of Orphans Future Alliance. We'll kind of get into some of that too. Um, she has led international Fortune 500 companies, um, teams at those companies. And she is CEO and founder at Imbiba, Tian Hong. Welcome. Thank you so much. You, like That introduction makes me feel so, wow. <laughs> <About myself. laughs> Well, it should. You're doing great things. And before anybody, she does have a cold today. And I, I feel yeah. a little bit sad for her. And then a little bit, oh, I'm just so glad she made it on the show. So I'm kind of Thank mixed emotions. Yeah, so, sorry. So I'm going to have to pre-apologize if I end up sniffling through through the whole thing. But I, I wanted to get on this. And I like love, love talking about, you know, a journey and like, really try to give a very humanized perspective of what it means to to run a company, just life perspective. I love these type of things. Well, cool. So thank you. I, it's an honor for, for me to be on. I Well, the listeners are excited to learn more about you. But before we actually get into mm -hmm. that, we always start the show with the same thesis. What is one thing that you can tell the listeners and viewers that will help them get out of the revenue maze? I think it is, you know, we've been back and forth about this a lot, but I mm -hmm. think if I have to sum it up, is just take a chance. One of the key thing in life is you must take a chance. Okay. And well, it's also risk. There's yeah. also risk. So, all right. People, there's these great ideas running around there and a lot of people don't take chances because of the risk. So give us a couple of pointers on how you've dealt with the risk. Because if you're saying take a chance, you're saying that for a reason, right? If we don't even start, mm -hmm. then we can't, there is no reward, yeah. you know? So, you know, it was, it was interesting. I was teaching a, a class at Northeastern University asked me to come in to help the future generation of women entrepreneurs. And so they had uh, just really amazing uh, high school student from around the world into their program. And they asked me to, to, to teach this course on it. And one of the thing I've said in my, uh, um, you know, at, at, in the class was that, and Bebo was just not the only, only ideas I've ever had. Like mm -hmm. since I was growing up, I've always had all these ideas and I'm sure everyone has ideas and they're like, what is this and that, but then they never act on the idea because th the acting part is the hard part of doing something, right? Yeah. So I was, and everyone thinks that you just have one idea and that's it. That's the most brilliant ideas you have <sighs> itself. So I was teaching, the, I was showing these girls um, that and maybe it's my third idea. So, and uh, as well. And so like I had idea for couponing app before couponing app was the thing. I even went through the entire journey of like trying to get it, but then I realized I don't have a technical expertise to it. So then you couldn't, you know, but like, it's just like, even to get there, you have to take a chance of actually diving into and like, not just talk about it. So like, I talk about like, I wanted to do a wedding, customized wedding dress and all these things. But like, a lot of these ideas are so complicated and technically you need someone who knows, um, you know, technology, um, coding and stuff. And that was just something I could not get myself to, I couldn't figure it out. Of course, you know, lots of other brilliant people have figured it out and made lots and lots of money out of it. But just taking that chance of actually diving into and not just going, I have this idea is really important. And some of it will succeed. And the three to four that I've right gone through just did not even get off the ground because of, uh, you know, I just didn't think I was the one to do it at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah, I think, um, I think that 
you bring up a great point of even starting because it's it's really hard. Uh, there's a lot of naysaying in the globe right now, right? You can't do it. You can't make this happen. This has already be, been done, right? Or this is we've always done it this way, right? And all of a sudden you have this, this bright idea and then people get nervous to, to explore it. Like there's a lot that goes around, um, I would say inventing period is, well, the masses might not like it. So emotionally, you've got to be able to get ready for people not like A lot of rejection. A rejection, <laughs> a right? Of and I think that that's part of the reason people don't start is they don't feel it's a safe enough environment, you know? Um, have you experienced mm -hmm. that? Experience oh my that? God, the entire time. <laughs> like when I started this, everyone's like, what? You're going to start a, a, a sensitive skincare company for children and you're going to work, you know, to help children with eczema. It's like, what are you doing? That is P&G and Johnson Johnson hasn't done. And all these things are like, you're, yes, you have tech thing, but you have absolutely no background in skincare, in product development, how are you gonna do it? And no one took me seriously. I like, even to the point when I, and you just gotta like, and for me, it's actually my personality of like, if you are gonna count me out, I'm totally gonna, <laughs> I, it's like super motivated to, to, to do the I told you so. And that's just my personality. I'm like, I'm always like that. And so that actually helped me get past them. Like, I'm gonna prove it to you. So, you know, I've done things even to the point where I got the prototype and everything. And I would ask friends and family, like, can you try it? Like nobody trusted my product uh -huh. because they're like, oh, I don't know. You know, this I'm like, I have a third party lab. I have dermatologists and pediatrician testing these things. I can show you paperwork. <laughs> it's not like I'm sitting here in my kitchen. You know, I'm not that type of an entrepreneur. You're sitting there in the kitchen, God bless them, but I'm not. And, and it's mostly because I work with such severe skin condition for the things mm -hmm. I could still not get them to work even to yeah. the point where like I have my product is live I'm at, like best products for the year at print magazine all these things still couldn't get my product to work and then some and then suddenly they're like I don't know what happened but like suddenly they're like I'm so desperate I'm gonna give your product a try kind of moment <laughs> and they're like oh my god it worked yeah it just took you three years to get there yeah. but so so and I always tell people the people who are going to be supportive of you, you'll be very surprised. It isn't going to be your friends. It isn't going to think because in, innately they want to do it too, but they can't. I feel like this uh, very, it's very interesting dynamic. Once you become an a entrepreneur, they love the idea of you being an entrepreneur and all these things, but they don't really like think you're going to succeed. And then when you do succeed, then it's a kind of weird like weird dynamic that happens and it's it's really strange but you get to know who your friends are and I like and the one that really supported me or actually other female founders I found a cohort of female founders who are really supportive of each other and so I think that's that's also that's also very helpful of like how do you you know move forward when everyone says no is that you have to have your own like cheerleading squad who's like you can totally do it because you're like your heart you're 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 you are your worst critic everyone tells me that because I'm so hard on myself all the time yeah 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 well and I think you know I was talking to someone yesterday even and I don't really get into male female you know mm -hmm. a lot but um you know, she pulled out a statistic and I actually heard it was even higher than this, but she said, well, 60, you know, if, if a male, um, if in the job market, they will apply for a job, even if they feel like they only have 65% of the qualifications, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, but yeah. females have to have it, you know, 85, 90% before they will apply for a job. Right. And yeah, and, that's definitely true. And so a lot of times we will limit that. So you do, you need that cheerleading squad that says you can do it. It's that little, little angel but on your shoulder, it's, right? It's a, it's also our women are just naturally risk averse to begin yeah. with. And that happens to everything. Like as part of, you know, we're, uh, like I'm very proud of the fact that we are, I was one of the rare one who was able to raise over a million dollars 
in, in funding from investors um, uh, for a first time investor, uh, first time, it's actually super hard for a first time founder without name cloud and all the crazy, like you have to go from like a Stanford, you're like, oh, you just have to have the word Stanford or like you're from away, whatever, you'll be fine. But if you're not, and it's very, very difficult. So I was able to do that, but I would say that men versus women, it is very difficult, like the going in front of all the investors, they ask you all these questions, like, how are you not losing my money, my money? I'm like, I don't see you asking like, you know, the Uber guy <laughs> or like Peloton, who like just had $1.2 billion losses. <laughs> you know, like, I don't see you asking those guys how you're not losing money, but, but why are you asking me how am I not gonna lose your money? So, but then it's like that risk averse, like women, you almost have to be very alpha. And luckily for me, my personality is super alpha. I'm like, it's probably because yeah. I'm such a tomboy growing up. So it's, it helps. So, it so I'm like super alpha where like at work as well. So I, that helps. But I feel like a lot of women are taken aback by it, even for me too. Um, on the question again, it's all these biases and guys are just, uh, the ability to BS is just astonishing. <laughs> astonishing. Um, and they can do it so well. Like, I, like, if I if I have to start BSing and, and people always tell me like you gotta like stretch this truth a little bit, you start I start to twitch. Like I start to feel very <laughs> uncomfortable and all these things. It just doesn't come out natural, you know. But the guys <laughs> yeah. the ability to like just stretch the truth a little bit to get there. It's yeah. like and I think that's what women just in general and people have to adopt is like win. And in order to win, what does it like don't win at all costs, but like win as much as you can and like figure out how to get there. And if you have to be like the most arrogant person, I guess you could, but I'm more of the homey type. I like to, to do things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. it, it helps, but it, it definitely, yeah, I think women really do have a, dis, have, have a quite a big hurdle to, to climb. Part of it is our personality. Part of it is we're very meek. We don't speak up. That happened to me in my own uh, workplace before. Mm -hmm. um, also very risk averse, not willing to take risks. That's why I said taking the leap is a big deal. Like for example, um, in my career, almost every single role I've gone into is never the role that I've actually applied for. I actually never applied for any role. They just <laughs> keep asking me to do roles and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. Like <laughs> really, they, they asked me like, do you want to go into... Um, you know, internationally to do like, to do ops operations and client service. I'm like, mm, okay, I have a <laughs> finance background. I'll figure it out. I think oh. most of it is just figure it out. So take that leap. I'm like, what else can you do? You fail, so fail, you know, yeah. but take that leap. Otherwise you'll never know. I think that's, that's the biggest thing is that if you don't take a leap, a chance, you just never know what you're capable of. And so I, I really believe in, in doing that. You know, you bring up a really, really good point on just even human behavior when we, I, I think I was listening to a TED talk and, um, you know, the, the big phrase right now is imposter syndrome, right? And <laughs> uh, imposter syndrome for women seems to be, I, I don't know if there's a stat out there, but you know, it's, it's, it's the very, whole very thing. High. It's very, very high. It's, I don't, I don't have that skill yet. Therefore I can't do it. Therefore I've got to figure out how to get a skill, but I will let you know when I've got that skill and then yeah. you can hire me. Right. Because it's like, yeah, yeah. Versus... It, it, it is very much like that because we want to, we want to be, we don't take 50, 50 shots. We're like, we gotta be like 80 in order for us to go and do a movement and move uh, to do something. Yeah. And most guys is like 20, <laughs> like 20. I'll just do it. You know, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. And imposter syndrome is so real for, for, for women, particularly women CEOs and founders and folks with really, because I mean, so I think Serena William actually said that too, like in the new podcast with um, Meghan Markle about imposter syndrome and how she didn't think she deserved to be, the, how amazing she is, you know, accomplishment mm -hmm. because of all these things. And I think that is really true. You know, every single time, for my own professional relationships and like all these accolades I've received, I'm like, are you really sure? Like when like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, when I was, when I was named Boston 40 under 40 uh, last year, I'm like, did they just rent out everyone on the list? <laughs> 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 I'm like always go 
was like, how the hell did I get that list? And like, or like when like uh, PNG like name in Biba, one of their next is three, three out of the 70 something company that they, uh, they did, they uh, reviewed and they thought the three out of next in, in, in STEM challenges for, for, me, for uh, consumer goods. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, again, it's like, huh? how did that happen? How did that you happen? Know, <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not like, and it was interesting because we're the only company that actually is not a, our innovation is truly different and unique in a way of behavior, user experience and stuff. It's not the medical, the botanicals and stuff that makes up the formulation itself. And while the other two companies are truly like, built like very pharmaceutical like so it's just Mm -hmm. as completely so when we were named next in stem challenge we're like "Eh?" (laughs) i was like i just don't you know like you don't know why they picked you obviously they picked you for a reason but for you for for me and a lot of the a lot of my colleagues there were just like i don't know and this and as you get more and more recognized you actually start to feel worse because you're (laughs) (laughs) because you're like I don't know what's going on. I don't think I deserve it because we always equate getting recognition with doing something extremely amazing. Mm -hmm. But the way we, what we think of the goal of doing something extremely amazing, I feel like we're never going to reach it because the the goal is now keeps moving for us. Um, Versus the guy was like, yeah, this is like, you know, like, (laughs) I I think imposter syndrome actually makes you have like a really lot of deep anxiety of like, and women go through this. Uh, I talked to this quite a bit with um, the women, uh, women entrepreneurship that I coach as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're all, they're always asking, like, I get deep anxiety of things. And I, I was like, I get imposter syndrome all the time. It's just, you hide it well in public yeah. and then in private you're like oh my god I don't know they're gonna find out I'm a fraud among other things yeah it's that whole <laughs> that whole insight I remember I was singing at at an event and afterwards they had asked me people asked me for my autograph and I'm like are you talking to me uh, and, and it's like I you know you don't like you don't even want to talk to anybody because you kind of walk off the stage, people have clapped, you do whatever you're doing, the audience is doing that, and then you accidentally run into one of them, you know, and then they're like, hey, can we get your autograph, and I'm like, I think we just don't do it as well, I mean, we're not, I mean, look at, um, we work for a founder, right, he just, like, we work in back, imploded, but hey, he finally, he built another company, got a check for $300 million, no problem, no problem, (laughs) no problem, like, (laughs) you could just go out and do it versus you know if if it was uh, if it was a woman and things imploded we just go hide because we're like <laughs> I, can't to, I can't show my face ever again because of one failure so that just like a really good illustration of the difference between women how we view risk and rewards and failure mm-hmm. compared to a guy yeah in in comparison to a guy i have led so many um sales teams and coach them. And I will say self load, I call it self-loathing behavior or limiting beliefs. Right. And, um, believe it or not, it is a huge problem among it. It's not, it's gender neutral among anybody who's in sales. Right. If Mm. you have to actually get them past, um, their own trip up. So when I call Mm -hmm. their own trip up, it's like, I'm a buyer and I always look at a discount. And so Mm -hmm. therefore all my customers will be looking for discounts, you know, or I am a buyer and I always buy only the top notch thing. I don't care what it costs. And therefore if customer service isn't creating that value, then I can't sell this product, you know? So you get this self Mm -hmm. limit, you know, and it's like, it's even when we, we boil it down to even perfectionism, it's almost like some sales team members will get to the point where the, the product has to be so perfect that they can sell it on the other side, because it is their perception of how they 
approach the market. You know, if mm-hmm. I go yeah, out, I do right. this. If I go this way, I, therefore everybody else is the same way, you know? And it's like, mm-hmm. no, it's an inherent bias. Yeah. Yeah. And in that one, I have found has been completely gender neutral, you know, mm-hmm. that, it's, that, that is true, you know, and, um, and it's surprising how, sometimes we talk about men hiding it, you know, or, or whatever, Mm -hmm. but sometimes when I've run in and coach men, they have the same, same feelings, but they go out and they hide it a lot. They just do it very well. Yeah. They hide it very, very well or, or they don't because they back to your original thesis, right? Take a chance. How many, how many men are out there that have not taken a chance and we just don't because they're not on the radar, but it is, it is statistically more, more driven by female, you know, females feeling that way. I, but men hides their feel, hide their feelings so much too. So I, but it's I, also, I think the way they're raised, the way that men are raised to play, yeah. if you think about it, right, we're very risk averse, we're women are risk averse, guys are taught to play like football and get killed, like <laughs> and everything. And it's like, well, I never understand dumb. the concept of football, to be honest. I was like, that just sounds brutal. And like all these things, there's like, you know, raised to be very risk, a risk taker, like yeah. doing all these things and <laughs> being able to be a risk taker is always being able to just have this can do mentality. Let me try it. Women just aren't, I think maybe it's also going back to how we are raised, We're raised to be True. not risk takers. And it may be, you said that, I think you said you were kind of, didn't you just say you're kind of a tomboy, you were raised. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was raised with, uh, with all broad, with all boys. Uh, yeah. We were, I was, yeah. So it's a little different. So my personality is very much like a boy. Yeah, I I have the same. And so sometimes I sit in this really like weird valley where mm-hmm. I because I have five brothers, those sometimes women don't get me and sometimes yeah, women yeah. Don't get me, right? I yeah, get yeah. like this weird Oh my goodness, yeah. <laughs> I, I do too. I do too because I'm just like my personality is so like alpha. So when I go and yeah, the dynamic is really really interesting and then you kind of like not sure where you actually fit in. Yeah, that was like, and that was actually more so in my younger days because it's like people just didn't know what to make of you when you're like such a ball buster and you're just like loud, <laughs> well, not loud, but like very forceful. Uh, and I'm very tiny, by the way, I'm like barely five feet. So when you see like this person coming in and they're like, you know, it's just like a four, a tour de force and you're like, but it's just that I grew up with guys. So it's just, I just like one of the buddies. So you kind of like, it's just so different. It really does have to come, it does come from, uh, from growing up that way. Yeah. And I'm yeah. trying to tell my, I'm trying to teach my child, my, my child to be very independent, also very risk, a uh, risk taker. Uh, just a caveat, I like my, I grew up with a mom who is a business person, who's a straight up entrepreneurs and stuff. So a lot of the, my entrepreneurial like desires and things and how I see to be so independent came from a, from seeing my mom, the way she worked and things like that. And um, that's just instilled into me, the hard work. And like, you need to, if you want something, you got to go get it and yeah. things like that. Well, you are definitely a go get it. You're a go, I mean, you are a force to reckon with. <laughs> that is for sure. You can definitely <laughs> you. feel that presence um, when you're talking. And so I, I'm curious a little bit, um, You've talked a little bit about how you've been raised, um, that's brought you to this point in your life and everything, but I haven't heard, le- I would like to know why you started in Biba. I'm just curious, what, yeah. what prompted you to do this? I, I mean, for children, especially, so you're, you're targeting very specifically a, a, a group, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So- it really started from my own need. And I think a lot of women entrepreneurs actually do this. It's actually from our own needs as well. Yeah. So I have severely sensitized skin hypersensitivity. And unfortunately, I passed it on to my two children, but particularly the yeah, my youngest right now. Oh. Um, and they have really bad, like, eczema and like all sorts of rashes, things like that. Oh, and shoot. I just nothing was really working, but I really wanted to, I've always been a healthy person. Um, 
And I always wanted to have a more healthy approach to, to managing skincare. And what I didn't like was that the first thing that a doctor would tell you or just anyone is like, steroid, have you put steroid on the kid? I'm like, you can't put steroid on the kid 24 seven, okay? It doesn't work that way. Yeah, you know, it actually impacts things. And then have you tried all these medication? I said, yes, but I think if you just think of it from a holistic, clean health living, I think it's very manageable. I've my, you know, I'm from uh, Vietnam and we always consider like a balance between healthy living, healthy eating and clean eating, clean living to and using medication as needed, which is kind of completely different from the West, which is like anytime problem, just go to CVS. <laughs> <laughs> Take a pill. So it's like it's yeah. a so it's just a mentality. So I wanted to, and what I saw was that I would like try to put all these um, type of like products on my child, particularly like the medication will work, and then once you get off it, it wouldn't work. Or I would use like in all the different like things that you see in the the store, uh -huh. it just contained too much petroleum. It just there wasn't really anything in there sure. that really would help. And I wanted something that was really natural and clean. And I'm not the type to tell you don't use, you know, just use natural product because that's that, that's that's crazy yeah. uh, as well. <laughs> um, but I always, I want, so that was the problem. And then the secondary thing was that I couldn't get my child to use it for a thing. You know, you oh. spend all this effort trying to find the product and then trying to get them to use it and is a, is a Herculean task by itself. So that's where I felt like there was this just real gap in addressing parents' need of not only effective, highly effective products that are steeped in natural-based remedies as much mm -hmm. as possible with the idea that we have to make the product work not only effectively, but work for the parents, make their life easier, really want to help children learn to love the skin they're in. And in order to do that, you want to make product that children actually want to use um, itself. So that's where the inception of like what a Biba came out to be is that we just really believe in a mission of helping children, particularly my own children, um, who, you know, from an infant all the way up is to be able to to use the product, to be able to communicate and uh, how like to communicate and own ownership of the product. So like, like, for example, I don't want to go to that product, but our product are used psychology as well as toy design theory for children. So okay. children as young as like 15 months, 16 months can independently use our product, no problem. Wow. And so, so they, and when they, and since an infant, they are able, like they see their parents using it. So they associate relief with our product. And mm -hmm. it's the way we designed it too, that then when they actually need, they feel like they need the relief, they will either point to the product or use it themselves, which gives you that positive association we want and that they actually would actually ask for the product. I think that's a big difference is that you want that positive association. If what, you think about how we grew up, right? We would run away if our parents tried to slather any type of medicine on us or yeah. stuff. And, and you don't really, and then you just have such a negative kind of ne negative association with and like rashes thing. Cause you're like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. It's going to burn. It's going to sting and all these things. Yeah. Um, and we want to get away from that because we think gentle parenting and really helping children, particularly children with skin issues, um, really learn to love the skin they're in and really own it yeah. and manage it properly. So you've gone basically through the process of adoption because that's one of the things mm -hmm. in healthcare is low utilization of whatever treatment mm -hmm. it is, right? That's why you end up with readmittances and you end yep. up with all of those. Um, I, 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 was, I benefited at one point being part of a group that was it introduced me to a woman named Gail Lindsay, and I, I call her out on LinkedIn all the time. And that is because they, Kaiser had started, Kaiser Permanente had started a preventative population care management. They were the gold standard because they started yeah. it like 2000, like early, I don't even remember which day. And some of it was probably beneficial, but one of and obviously being a payer and a provider at the same time, you could see that it would help save to create more treatment and all that. But on the other side, when you had um, people who would adopt, 
you would have better quality of life. Right. Yeah. And so it was, it was, how do you get people to adopt something that will make their life better and associate it with something good. Right. And you've just yeah. done that. And children in those formative ages, they're learning if I put my hand on the stove and it's hot, it hurts, right? Yeah. If I, you know, that's mm -hmm. all those triggers. So that how you've tied that whole psychological um, adoption, the whole, I don't know, I, I, I wish I, I act like I'm smarter than I am, right? <laughs> so we're at, but at the end of the day, that's so smart because yeah. the emotion draws us to keep going, right? And adopt a behavior. And yeah. sometimes we just never adopt a behavior because it's either too hard or it hurts or, you know, it's, it's, it goes back to your original thesis, just start or, you know, try it, you know, go yeah. ahead. And, you know, for us, we have a parent panel testing panel that, that inform us of like, is it, you know, from behavior standpoint, what's the troubling things for them? I think the biggest thing is also when you producing any type of products or services, you don't want to make people jump through hoops to, to adopt it. Make really. it easy. Make yeah. it easy. So like for, for us, we didn't ask the parents or the child to change their behaviors. What sure. we didn't, we didn't enforce them to like, you know, go out the way to change the behavior. So from a diapering experience, you're still using a, a product on your, the diapering area as part of your everyday routine. Yeah. What we made it, what we did was just made it easier for them because our diapering product is mess free. It's a two push up sustainable and you swipe it in and go. The parents, mm. they just shave themselves time. It's not like they, they stop diapering the kid. It's just they diaper the kid smarter. And that, that's really what it is. So like, as yeah. long as you don't change the, be you don't forcefully make someone change the behavior, but you subtly make them change the behavior, that is when, that, that's what makes a uh, product succeed. Exactly. So that, that is, I, I love that because it brings up challenges that I had with when I was raising my kids. I had a daughter who is now, older and I'm an empty nester. And I remember the challenges we had with diapering at that time. Right. And oh, yeah. she would literally, I had to literally go to cloth diapers, 100% in a time where wow. everybody was doing disposable diapers. Right. Yeah. And all the laundering and all the issues. Why? Because that daughter would scream and cry because her skin burned. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was just this awful, awful thing. And as a parent, you're like, oh, I don't want them to cry. So you'll do anything, but you're talking, I mean, to make it stop. Right. But yeah. You will, you're talking about even little tiny children adopting this so that you don't have to wait till they scream and cry or do anything. Exactly. To force it, right. I love it. Yep. Absolutely yep. love it. So you really are solving some kind of challenge. You're making it easy on everybody, not just the yep. child, but everybody for adoption. So yeah, that's like product development 101, right? You want, <laughs> that's the way to go. Well, you'd be surprised. A lot of products out there, they're made for the, they're, they're made to check off the list of the buyers. And sometimes, and a lot of time the buyers are the, are the, the users, right? When mm -hmm. they're older. But what people, but like a lot of the companies don't do well, and that's yeah. where the, the white space for us and what's where we hone in is that in the early informative year from infant to like 15, 16 years old, the users are not the buyer. Yes. So you have to status, so you have this like two prong approach you need to take. Um, and it just goes back to, you got to know your customers. You got to know who you're making the product for and sure. Um, making sure that you're actually solving a problem. Yes, exactly. So you went through that whole cycle of it. So this has been very, very exciting to learn about in Biba because it was something that wasn't on my radar, partially because it's not, um, when my grandkids come, maybe it will show back up on my <laughs> demographic. Right. But it wasn't part yeah. of part of what I was doing. And, um, I think it's, it's super exciting, super exciting for any, any, 
any rounds that are coming super excited, super exciting for entrepreneurs to learn how you've done it. Um, and then just super excited in this dialogue about, um, yeah, I mean, just this psychology of starting, yeah, like yeah. trying something and solving a challenge to boot at the same time. Yeah, you may not win all of them. And you mentioned that you'd, you know, so a lot of times I will ask on this show kind of, well, what would you tell your, you know, your older wise yourself, you've got this great thing, it's launching, if things are going well for you, what would you tell your younger wiser self to do? I, I think I, I mean, should, your I younger self, your older wiser self to your younger <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. self, sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would say start earlier. Like, I don't know. I was so, and this is part of like, when you're in a very comfortable position and things, you it's hard. It actually gets harder and harder to get out of it. Um, I think that's why I always encourage young, younger um, folks to start the company, to start taking that leap and to start whatever they want to do, just start in their 20s. Because the higher you grow, and then you have obligation, you have families and all these things, it gets harder and harder to, to take that leap. Yeah. So for me, I would say that, but it all like coincided because this company was born out of the fact that it was for my children. So sure. <laughs> I probably wouldn't start this company earlier if, if I don't have children, because I, I wouldn't know what the company would be about, um, you know, but at the same time, I would just say like, try to start a lot earlier um and take more risk like yeah. take a lot more risk yeah I think I, even with building the company I just did not take as much risk as a lot of other folks because I I had a, a certain way I wanted to do things well that that's that's good advice that I I kind of tell people suspend no until you've actually explored right <laughs> and see yes, what yes yes you know just take a moment and, you know, it's Jim Carrey's Yes Man. I always use that as an example, his movie, you know, as a yes man and all these amazing things happened because he said yes. And then he had to it does. dial it, it back. It actually does because it's yeah. like you, you just never know, right? So you always have to continue on. And then something will always happen to your, mm -hmm. like that you're not, you're always going to end up being very surprised about. Um, but it also just takes you from, from just taking that, I said, leap of faith, like starting. It's not even just starting. It's just continues to do things um, every single step of the way. Starting is hard, continuing to, to do. It's even harder. Um, yeah. But I think that mentality of like, just say yes to everything, just start, <laughs> just like, in the beginning, it actually makes sense to say, well, once, and then you you have to say no sometime because otherwise it's too much, yeah. but never say no right away. Say a maybe. A maybe. Suspend no for just a yeah, moment. Exactly. Just I like that. No. I like that. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. You just, I, a lot, we've, we've talked business, we've talked best practices, we've gone through a lot in this episode. And um, so a lot of them are curious about just Tyann. Yeah. What is she like in her personal life? You just got back from a family vacation that you were like, yeah. I had to have some wine, I had to do all this other stuff. What do you, <clears throat> what do you like to do in your free time? What is, what? Yeah. Um, Actually, I'm quite, I'm like, uh, I always, my husband always makes fun of me because he thinks I'm like a 70 year old person and like a 40 year old. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I really like to do old people stuff. So I'm, I'm actually quite introverted. Um, so people always very surprised by that when they meet me is that how introverted I am. I'm extroverted uh, when I like in business setting, but like, but that exhausts me. And then when it, I'm it like, does. introverted um, most of my life, but what I really like is, you know, I'm very family centric. So for me, and I come from a very large family of relatives and, and clan. Um, and I love gardening. 
Okay. Actually, I picked up gardening because my um, I was very stressed out, and um, my doctor recommended I like do yoga, and I'm like, I can't even sit through one minute, like thirty seconds <laughs> or something, without fidgeting. I'm like, this is not gonna work. I'm like, I cannot do yoga, and this like, why don't you try gardening? So yeah, I, I picked up gardening uh, because to help with stress management, and I just really love it because I feel like it's very similar to starting anything. You have to start. There's a lot of trial and error. Uh, I probably yeah. killed a lot more plants than I want to, um, but then when it worked, you're like, oh, you know, but it takes so much, such a long time to build something and gardening is virtually the same. And you realize that things just takes time to do it. Yeah. And I like to, to cook if, if I can. Um, yeah. I'm kind of boring. I'm sorry, guys. I'm really a boring. Oh, uh, no, <laughs> no, no. I mean, um, but yeah, nothing's, nothing's boring. It's just, it's an interest, you know, it's what kind of what you do. And, you know, there's nothing better than homegrown tomatoes and, you oh, know, yes. any kind of vegetable garden. Heck yeah, no, that's a great skill to have. Yeah. I, I share this bond with my, my 80 year old uh, father. We're both gardeners. <laughs> Well, and then it gives you guys something to do together <laughs> as family, right? Yeah, that gives like, you... well, he, he doesn't live with, he doesn't live in Massachusetts with us, but like he oh. would text me photos of his like ginormous pumpkin and stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing that I'm not doing right <laughs> about my, my thing? Yeah, so it's nice. Um, What's your secret sauce? Getting, <laughs> yeah, so it's like just getting closer to nature. I think like it just, you know, being close to nature, like going closer to the food source and all these things is actually a really good. I think we're so stuck inside and like everything is so electronic. We kind of like lost touch with nature. And yeah. so I always think that the more time you spend outside, the better. I, and actually the, the one of the other reason I started gardening is because I like wanted my children to really enjoy like learning about like picking fruits and vegetables and have a really, again, this kind of side psychology behind mm -hmm. it is to have them get a very positive association with, with food, with natural food um, mm -hmm. and like loving a tomato and things like that, which you not normally wouldn't if you just go to a grocery store. Oh, well, it sounds all very fascinating and the listeners have really enjoyed probably listening to uh, to you. <laughs> and um, honestly, I'm so grateful that you uh, agreed to come on this show and talk about best practices and what how you got to where you are today. Where is, they would love to know, where is one thing? place that's the best place to get a hold of you if they would love to talk to you invest whatever you're want you know wanting Definitely LinkedIn you just like uh, find me on LinkedIn I'm always happy to connect with with people um and it's always funny it's like I love having chats with the people so particularly entrepreneurs who are just starting out I want to give back because I remember when I started out I was talking to some like really big name who I couldn't believe like was agreed to talk to me uh -huh. um, in the industry. And I was like, yeah. oh my God, you know, it was, like, <laughs> it was amazing. The yeah. door just opened. So I definitely always want to do that is just to help the next generation of like entrepreneurs. Well, that's awesome. Well, everyone, thank you so much for listening. This has been an, another great episode on the Revenue Maze. And I just am grateful for the listeners. If you like this, share it, love it, do whatever you want to do with it. But um, let Diane know, also know that you liked it, loved it and everything else and certainly reach out. And again, thank you so much, Diane, for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I truly enjoyed this. <laughs> thank you all for joining another great episode. For show notes, links and resources, visit revenuemaze.com. Hats off to all you small businesses out there. I can't wait for the next episode.